So welcome back to another episode of the Pitch BTCC show. Incredibly, it's the last show of the season. Hasn't that gone quickly? But I'm joined here by a really important guest for the season, Ash Sutton, who won his third championship of the weekend. Always looked odds on to win it, but you know what touring cars is like. Anything can happen. Ash, how was the weekend for you? Uh, it, it was a... Uh... It was a sort of another dream come true. It was, it, I, I didn't plan it to be as good as that, if I'm honest. I thought it was going to be a bit, little bit more stressful and, and going down to the line. But yeah, it was definitely the perfect way to end off the season. Yeah, no, a great job by you and the team, really. You, I think you won everything that you could possibly win. I think it's, is it only the Jack Sears and the manufacturers that the you and the team haven't won? Yeah, exactly. Um, we we obviously we can't we can't go for the manufacturers because we're not, and obviously Jack um, the Jack Sears Cole got beat by uh, by Dan Robom. So yeah, it was um, it, it was it was mega. It was phenomenal. So as an outfit, it was, it was perfect. No, it's brilliant. So let's go back a little bit. The, you know, you've you've had massive British touring car success now, but obviously that's got to have started somewhere. And as in most cases, it started with karting. So tell me about how you got involved with motorsport. Yeah, karting. Um, mum and dad, sort of, my dad actually used to race drag, dragsters. Um, he had a funny car and he, he used to take it up to Santa Pod and places like that. So it was a different element of racing, but it was still racing nonetheless. Um, and yeah, we, it, it soon started off as a sort of a, a family thing on a, on a Saturday and Sunday where we go to a local kart track at Rye House and, and go around and have a bit of fun. And you know how it goes it sort of then progresses and before you know it you're entering your local club championships then it rolls into a national stuff and then we soon found ourselves in in europe and around the world racing in, in carts so yeah it, it was something i started at the age of oh, going back now very late five go, just going six um six years old and yeah i raced in karting all the way up through to i was sort of 13. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you, you you sort of gloss over the bit where you raced all around the world in the World Championships, but that's an incredible achievement for you and the family to get that far in karting. Because I mean, you you you, you know you, you're okay, but you're not you know not multi millionaires, are you? To get that is a massive achievement. Yeah, I was very lucky in terms of um, some support that I had in karting. So in terms of like the carts, the chassis, we were. We were very fortunate that the manufacturer, um, local based team, that they supplied all that side of things sort of free of charge. So, um, yeah, Nick Jest at, at Octane at the time, they were the they were the guys that sort of backed me there. The engine side of things, we we fell on our toes. We we knew the um, the engine builder very well, Ricky Grice, and yeah, it was soon sort of every the package started to be formed around that, and we pulled in a few little sponsors, but when we're talking sponsors in car and it's not tens of thousands, it's sort of hundreds of pounds and, but it made a difference and it allowed us to go and race around the world. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, you mentioned the name there, Ricky Grice. It shows you how old I am. He was in, he was in seniors when I was in junior carts many, many yeah, years yeah. ago. Really quick carter actually. He was yeah. full on. Now, now I know he's an engine tuner. I know how, why he was so quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly that. So yeah, obviously I, I ended up having his son's engines um, when, when Tom moved up. I end up having his engine. So that's kind of how we fell into that. Okay. Yeah, no, it's good. Well, well fantastic karting career. And then as is usually the case, people look to move up into single seaters, but a slightly different route for you. And also another little connection with me, because I started in Formula V as well. And then you started in Formula V, which is the sort of the flat four air-cooled engine single seater yeah. formula. So how did that come about? Yeah, it was, um, it was one of those sort of, ways of looking at what we ultimately wanted to go and do in terms of racing it was to get get in the touring cars um but how can we go and learn the tracks at a real cost effective um in a real, real cost effective way and ultimately formula v covered pretty much all of the tracks i think there's one track we didn't go to um so we we committed to that it was a nice cheap racing um it got my head around racing in a car instead of a car and obviously understanding the elements of a car, the suspension, the damping, etc. Um, yes, they're a little bit old school, should we say, um, but it's still the same. It's still four wheels and steering wheel and the dynamic is very, very similar. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, and also you get used to lots of oil on the track because I know Formula V. Like <laughs> that is very true. Maybe that's why I've got uh, the wet touch. <laughs> <laughs> no, used to that. No, but a great formula and a great way for people to get involved in single seaters, but without spending the fortunes that you need to spend if you're going sort of Formula Four, as it's called now. You know, that sort of route is then suddenly a big jump up. But that's where you sort of went. It was still Formula Ford then, but then you made the step up to Formula Ford. Yeah, it was. Um... I'm trying, it was sort of that hybrid era. So Dan Camish was sort of that last person in terms of when it was Formula Ford. And we were just in that flip over stage before it went F4. Mm. Um, and yeah, 2014, we, we ended up having a essentially a Formula Ford car with slicks and wings. So it was halfway house, as I, I called it. And that was my sort of first time on, on the Toke platform. Um, my first time there. And uh, yeah, first proper year in, in a proper single seater car. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, because you, you had a great season, you know, you had some some good results, but probably, I don't know, you, you, you single seaters worked for you and obviously you've got massive talent, but it seems like saloon cars are maybe, maybe more your sort of thing. I like getting my elbows out a bit more. Obviously, single seaters, you can't quite do that as much. Um, we didn't quite get a full campaign that year. We missed Donington Park altogether, so we actually missed three rounds so to still finish third in in the championship it was still an achievement um but yeah when I got the carrot dangled to get in a saloon car it was uh it was kind of the ultimate goal and and that's it was sort of the the more direct path of where I wanted to be so that was where you made your sort of first contact with Warren Scott from BMR and I know he he's been quite instrumental in your career to to make that step up you know, into sort of, you know, doing the great results that you're doing at the moment. So, so did you, how did you guys meet in the Toka paddock or or somewhere else? It was quite funny, really. Um, the guys that sort of supported me all the way through my karting career, they, I ended up actually working for them. They had a local shop at the kart track, and it was sort of become my my day to day job, um, helping them run the race team stuff. And Warren actually bumped, I bumped into Warren at Rye House. He come in the shop. I think he, it was like a chain or sprocket for his kart or something silly like that. And I ended up actually serving him over the counter. And obviously then you click and go, oh, you're Warren Scott, you're doing touring cars and blah, blah, blah. And I think over sort of three or four months, we got to know each other a bit more. He kept coming in and out of the shop. Um, obviously I saw him at the track because I was competing in Formula Ford. Um, and yeah, it was it just that connection and that relationship started to grow sort of the back end of 2014. And and yeah, he put that deal in front of us and and turned me down, down the, the path of being a touring car driver. Yeah, so, so then you went clear cut racing. With, with with Warren and you won the championship, didn't you? Yeah, so set out to to do two years in Cleos um, on the basis that we try and win it in the second year. But I kind of threw his plan out the window and made mine one up of uh, trying to do it in the first year. So <laughs> we kind of come unstuck a little bit at the end of the year because he was like, oh, do we make the step up into touring cars or do another year? But obviously, as you saw, we, we, we found ourselves in that in MG in 2016. But... Yeah, it was a mega first year, ran with Pyro Motorsport. So at the time, they were the boys to be with. Um, and I just gelled with it, gelled with front-wheel drive and managed to, to take it at the final round. Well, you don't seem to mind a car moving around underneath you. It seems to be quite a natural thing for you. So a front-wheel drive saloon car does a lot of that. And, and, and it's a slightly different way of connecting. So I mean, was it, was it a big step up going front-wheel drive? Was that a big change for you? It wasn't. I think the first couple of days, I just had to... You know, you know what they're like. They're a little bit nervous on the rear axle in comparison. So once I kind of got my head around letting the thing move about behind me and kind of ignore it, then, yeah, I, I found myself at home in the car. Um, I then just had to get my head around the racing element. It was the first time that I'd been in a sort of saloon car, tin top car, whatever we want to call them, um, and actually could lean on people and then maybe a little bit of door to door. And to be fair to Ant Wharton Hills, he was the one that showed me that brands acting in the opening rounds. Yeah, and Ant likes it sideways. I think he does. He forgets that it's front wheel drive. He thinks it's got a big V eight sitting in the front of it. I think. Yeah, he, <laughs> he didn't mind letting the rear of the car move about. That's for sure. <laughs> so that's so one that the the step moves moves up. You go to British Touring Cars with the Triple Eight team, which has also got a connection with Warren as well with the MGs. Now I remember it because I think the first race was at Donington, wasn't it? Did you qualify on pole position? Uh 
I'm trying to think what it was now. It was Brands, wasn't it? But the media day was Donington. Oh, okay. And you were fastest. You and Josh were fast because Josh Cook was your teammate, who you, you're still really good mates with as well. Which is, is I, I really like seeing that because you, you two get on well, but still race hard together with each other. But but I think everybody in the paddock suddenly went, "Wow, where's this kid come from?" He's suddenly sticking it right up the front of the grid. Yeah, it, it was an odd day that it was almost. Well, whenever when's everyone else going to start going faster? Because. I kind of was still trying to get used to a touring car. It was my first proper day in one. And we were sat top of the timesheets and it just didn't quite add up in my own head. I was waiting for people to be sticking on new tyres and going faster. And it was only the very end of the day, I think Matt Neal pit me by a tenth or so. But uh, yeah, it was it was a bit of a culture shock to myself. I'll be honest with you, I didn't expect to be where I was come, come meeting down and obviously the first round as well. So a British touring car compared to a Clio, a, a big difference. Um, lap times, actually, surprisingly, not that much difference. But, I mean, driving-wise, completely different ball game. But you adapted quite quickly to it. Yeah, the car, obviously, a, a British touring car, there's, in terms of, shall we say, setup and, and the engineering of one, it's, it's a lot more advanced in terms of what the Clio was. So when you start in talking of, of elements like bump steer and, and things like that, you then have to learn a different driving style to adapt to that. And that was something that I found was a step. I was ultimately, lap time, like I said, isn't a massive jump. The tire's a little bit bigger. You have to sort of manage a tire a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't find that sort of step up to British touring cars as hard as what some, some others. Yeah, yeah. No, no, some people do struggle with it. You know, they struggle to, you know, get there. But I, I always think that if, if, if you're good, you're good and you're going to get straight to the front and, and you'll be there straight from the word go, which is what you did. But thanks very much for chatting us about that. Join us after the break. We're then going to look at what Ash did after he started in touring cars. And it's a hell of a lot. <laughs> Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by the 2021 British Touring Car Champion, Ash Sutton. How does that sound, Ash? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice start to start to sink in now, that's for sure. <laughs> no, brilliant. So going back a few years, we were talking before about running in the MGs with Triple Eight, with Josh Cook as your teammate, and how you sort of didn't seem to be really phased by British Touring Cars. But the results were there. You had a pole positions. You had a race win, maybe two, but you lost one in, in the uh, technical stewards room, if you like, rather than you. But also, I think you, you had a few visits to the bus, as they call it, which is going to see the stewards. But I think that's about a little bit about learning the sort of rough and tumble of British touring cars. A hundred percent. Yeah, I, I experienced the highs and lows that year. Like you said, first pole, first win, first disqualification from, from obviously British touring cars. Uh, sat in the stewards, got points on my licence. I did everything. You name it, I did it that year. But um, ultimately, that gave me all the tools I needed for the following year. I learned what I can and can't do, what you can get away with, what's classed as a touring car move. What's classed as that's a step two mark. Um, and obviously got an idea of how the drivers are as well. There's a big element of you've got to know your machinery, but you've got to know who you're racing. Yeah, exactly. I, I, so I always think, you know, having run a team and seen motor racing over the years, it's actually really difficult to get someone who's sort of in control and make them step up. Somebody who's sort of at them, like wants to fight everybody who's possibly around them all the time to, to sort of lower that down a little bit. That's doable. And that's exactly what I said. I mean, you were fantastic. I mean, I remember watching and you, you knew that any time that your car was anywhere near any of our cars, there was down to be a bit of a bit of rough and tumble going on. But, you know, that, that's that's part of it, isn't it? It is a big learning experience. I think people underestimate how difficult touring cars is. It is a steep learning curve. Um, and like you said, that I was a newborn block. I was sort of putting a few noses out of joint, should we say, um, People didn't like it. They were kind of giving me the elbow. I know a couple of times I got showed the door by Matt Neal and things like that, but <laughs> I gave it back to him. And OK, I might have not finished the race with a puncher or something silly, but we got that mutual respect between each other. And a little bit of British touring cars is a bit, a bit, a bit of that. And uh, yeah, I, I went through my, I had my, my bad times. And I had my good times. Yeah. So at the end of that year, the, the sort of end championship result wasn't great, but you definitely sort of put your name on on the board and put a few markers down. But the next three years, BMR, who was sort of involved with Triple Eight, there was a bit of a correlation there with Warren with Warren Scott, managed to do a deal with Subaru, which is incredible. Managed to get 
an estate car on the grid and then also managed to to win the British touring cars with it. I mean, how did that all come about? Yeah, I think it was it was an odd scenario because obviously it was the second century, the second year of the Subaru. Obviously, they had it running in, in 2016, but um, obviously winning the Clio's a year early sort of led me to that gap year. And that gap year was when we jumped in the Triple Eight MG with Ian Harrison and, and Mickey Sardin running it. But I kind of then, in 2017, jumped in the original plan, if that makes sense. That I wanted to go from Clio's up into, into the Subaru and, and start the journey there. So obviously a seat come available, Colin jumped back in, in the BM and I sort of semi-replaced what Colin was in to line up alongside the likes of Jason and, and obviously James Cole and Josh Price at the time. Um, so it was a big step. It was a big, big step. First time in a real drive car um, in, in terms of touring car spec. Um, but yeah, it was it was a uh, it was mega to actually shake your hand, get the contract signed, and, and get out there. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, and, and also I think you're a, a big part of the success of the Habitat car. Another big part of it was you know it was a, a bit of a a strange car for British touring cars. I mean, I know back in the day Volvo had an estate. Honda tried to have an estate. I think it was about the same sort of time, but that didn't really work out as successful. But the team managed to get that car working well. And I think one of the big points was its its sort of engine placement of and the type of engine that it had. It was managed managed to sort of the handling of it was quite unique, let's say. Yeah, it was a very, very unique car. Um obviously there was this, shall we say, uh, big cloud hovering over the top of the subject of where the engine is. Um, the engine placement and stuff like that. It was, it was such a low, low slung engine in terms of the way it was built. Um, being a flat four based engine, it, it meant we could push it quite far back in, in the engine bay. And obviously I wasn't around when it got first brought to touring cars. So I wasn't really involved in the politics, but unfortunately I've become part of it when we started trying to fight for, for power because it, it was, it was led to believe that we had a massive advantage in terms of uh, central gravity when ultimately it wasn't a big, big chunk, but yeah, it, it was it was a tough task, but we we achieved what many didn't do, and that was to to win the British touring cars in an estate. No, exactly. Well, and you have to actually say, and I, it, everybody else could have done that if they wanted to. So it's like you know, it's not it's nothing new. But I mean, it, you, their team was getting a really good reputation for engineering quality and sort of really making the most of opportunities, which which also coupled to you. And then you had you had Jason Plato alongside you with years of experience as well. It was, it was a really, really strong team. Yeah, I, I, like that's one thing I, I can always remember Warren saying that he believed in the guys that he had working on the cars. And in terms of the engineering crew, Carl Foe at the time, who's off in, in V8 supercars now, he, he was the one that sat there and designed a car alongside Kevin Berry. Um, so you've got two of the greats, what I would say, in terms of British touring car engineers um, that have built that car. And then you've got the proper data engineers, the mechanics, the crew that are behind that car, or all four cars were obscene. And Warren believed in these guys. And, and that, that was a big key element to giving the, the, the car the potential of winning a championship and winning races. No, exactly. I mean, a perfect. I mean, a perfect example, really, that the the team in sort of there's, there's lots of elements of that team that you're still working with as well. Um, and and I think you, the team members tend to get attached to their drivers, and if they sort, of, it's a little bit like go, going over the top in World War One, maybe. If you you know if you've got somebody that you, you feel that you can follow, you want to stick with them, really, and that's who you want to go with. And I think that's that's credit to you, and also to the team that that, that there's still lots of guys around you working together. Yeah, we've I, I've managed to sort of, should we say, built this team that I've dragged all the way from sort of 2017 to now. And that's a reason to part of my success. Um, Tony, my engineer now, he was a data engineer on my car um, in 2017. And he's managed to progress up um, himself and, and step up to the and replace someone like Carl Foe. And he's done a fantastic job. I've got the, the number ones, number two chief mechanics. They're all there. They're all the guys that I've had for the past three or four years. So after your success with the Subaru, next big step is is the Infinity. You know, a, another rear wheel drive car, another slight oddity isn't the right word, but it's you know it's not a regular car that you see on the road all the time. But a team had had it before; they'd had introduced it, and it wasn't competitive. So again, it shows the strength of the team that they've turned that chassis shape and and layout into a championship winning car. Yeah, obviously the car that, um, should we say, the Moffitt family sort of running the back end of 2019 was 
she was old. Uh, it was an old car. It was sort of, if I remember correctly, from 2014 yeah. um, when it when it was first introduced into touring cars. So it sat around, not done much, didn't have much background behind it. And we kind of got a, a chance to jump in it on behalf of Aiden to sort of steer him in a bit of the right direction in 2019. And I jumped out the thing and said, I'd, I'd, I'd run it for the rest of the year. And bear in mind, it was an old car. Yeah. So over... Over that winter period and on the build the 2020 season, we built two brand new Infinities and they were completely different to what we would class as the original one. Um, but man, they were a bit of kit. They were so good. And again, the BMR engineering guys were the ones that uh, they got, got that car to where it was. But with the support of the Moffitt family and, and Laser Tools Racing, we we collaborated with them and, and the, the end result, well, you, you've seen it now, it's two years on the bounce. You two together, and again with with Bob Moffat, his dad involved in that side of it as well. It's it's, it's been a big improvement. I mean, that's, again, it shows you you can't win team championships without two strong drivers. And I think you're, you know, Aiden's credited you a lot with the help that you've given to him to come through, and that's you know that, that's really given you a helping hand because every now and again, especially last weekend, Aiden was there a little bit as your rear gunner uh, and was able to take take points off your title title contenders. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think if we look back at, shall we say, what the Laser Tools Racing team was, it was a family-run team and there was nothing wrong with that. What they were doing, they were enjoying the motorsport. But when we got involved, it kind of, the whole thing just stepped up an, another notch and, and we, we we cracked on with the job. And it was a big learning curve for the Aiden in, in 2020. But towards the back end of it, he, he, he started to get his head around it. And we worked a lot in terms of sim stuff and, and during testing to, to get him there for this year. And him get, being there in, in, in terms of the pace, the performance, the results that he's shown this year has allowed us to now walk away with that, that team championship. But at the same time, he's, like I said, he supported me. He supported my campaign in both years now. And um, yeah, he, I couldn't ask for a better wingman, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. I've seen Aiden racing. I mean, I think I was on the grid next to him the first time he started in touring cars, 2013 or something. This season has been the season I've really seen him really enjoy his racing, I think, compared to previous seasons. Yeah, he's loved it. And what I actually enjoy now hearing is when he's disappointed for not being in a top five or something like that. Where before, and this is being kind to Aiden, he, it wasn't, he didn't have that kind of buzz about him. Where now he can see there's a different Aiden inside and, and it, it's great to see that. It's it's absolutely mega. Well, it's been great to hear from you and see exactly how you've got up the British Touring Car Ladder. But join us after the break and we'll find out exactly what it takes to win a British Touring Car Championship from Brands Hatch last weekend. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by Ash Sutton, the 2021 British Touring Car Champion, and also Matt Salisbury from Inside BTCC, who's got some stats to find out exactly how you win three championships and, and how the points and podiums and race wins stack up over Ash Sutton's British Touring Car career. But first, let's look back at the highlights from Brands Hatch last weekend and see how it all went for the championship contenders. The day is go. One or two crept a little bit, it looked like, but a good getaway is made by Senna Proctor. Good start also by Robotham, who slots in behind the VTC duo as they make the run now up towards Paddock Hill Bend for the first time. A bold effort is being made by Colin Turkington then to try to get through the traffic, and so is Ash Sutton. Look, he's on his toes right away. And there, Rick Parfit having to go to get past Carl Bordley. Jade Edwards is next in the queue. Rick Parfit then running in 25th place. They're outside the points, but a good scrap going on here. And Corey Butcher to the inside of Adam Morgan and Preserve. 16th place, Adam coming back in, they're outside the points, but here you've got drivers that have been race winners this year, absolutely toe-to-toe, -to -toe. Adam Morgan goes back through on the inside, it's Hill Ingram and they touch as they accelerate past the BMW, and also Chris Smiley tries to get past Jenny as well, but his BMW suddenly has lost not only places, but pace, that's Oliver getting right into the back of Bonnie Jackson, hurry up Bonnie, he says, second on the grid, it's going to be win number four of the season, Race one of the day at Brands Hatch is won by Josh Cook in a 1-2 for BTC Racing. Senna Proctor second. Ash Sutton comes across the line sixth. 
and he's ahead of Turkington and Hill and Ingram. That's great news in the championship. And here comes Ingram, one last chance to get past Hill. He's worked oh so hard all race. Look at Morgan in the background coming up alongside Smiley. It's going to be a drag race to the line. And between those two, Morgan got ahead of Smiley for 14. It'll be blast off now. And who makes the best start? It's Sutton. Turkington tries to get up the inside. Sutton gets boxed in behind Dan Lloyd. And here comes Turkington up the inside line. The BMW is there as Shedden attacks the BTC Hondas. And yes, there's contact there. Look, because Sutton gets a tap in the tail. Turkington's got ahead of him. That, I fear, might have been Chilton getting into the rear of Sutton. For the race lead, there's drama at Druids already because off the road goes Santa Proctor. And the round goes in front of everybody. Jackson. That's Ollie Jackson. Oh! Adam Morgan hits him. Uh, that's Morgan's race. Oh, no, that's Ingram being delayed. Look, Tom Ingram is in the gravel, and that's crucial for third place against Jake Hill. So... And that is Rory Butcher getting squeezed by Aidan Moffat. He's on the grass. He still keeps the coming up the inside line. The two Scottish drivers lean on each other. Chris Smiley tries to get into that as well. But look at the lawn in the front of the Toyota now. That's going to make it really hot. There's contact as Moffat hits Smiley and gets hit by Jelly. More mayhem in this race. Yes, yes, yes. The Ford comes up on the inside. So Jake Hill will cross the line ahead. Yep, another place taken. And, that's, and there, Road Bottom is sideways. This is Turkington's chance. He gets the run on the way up the hill. So, yes. Now, Turkington is about to take a place and therefore points away from Robottom. He's going to be a race win for Josh Cook. A fifth win of the season for Josh Cook. Round 29 of the championship, but in the traffic behind. Back-to-back -back titles, a third crown for Ash Sutton. He is British touring car champion with a race to spare. And he is absolutely <coughs> delighted as he comes across the line. And although he's been saying it's not been too stressful over the course of the weekend, you can now see that release of the emotion. Delight on the pit wall at Laser Tools Racing and in the garage. It has been a fantastic season and he has done a great job. Race three, lights go red. The action starts now. Sutton gets a good launch. Butcher doesn't, slithers off the line a little bit. Stephen Jelly leads on the run up towards Paddock Hill Bend. Tom Chilton has a look on the outside line. It is Ash Sutton who takes third then, with Dan Robottom next in the queue as they turn out of Paddock for the first time. Up the hill towards Druids, Jelly leads, Chilton is second through, and that is Turkington being run out wide. He's all over the grass. Turkington's going to have a big, big moment. He might have just about hung on to that. He has, but he's, and the door is open, so this should give Sutton the advantage. Robo's looking for a double toe as they come up across the line. Sutton's going to hit the front. Robottom's on the inside line for second. He gets crowded a bit by Jelly. Jelly tries to stay on the outside. Robottom hits the curb. He can't find a way past. Absolutely nose to tail. Good defence by Jelly of second place. Now Robottom tries the outside line. Remember, he tried that here in the summer against Oliphant on the outside. It didn't work then. Is it going to work now? It is. From the outside to the inside. He's on the inside for Graham Hill Bend. And he's done it. Has he? Has he? Has he? Yes! Finally through. Jelly out wide over the curb. Here comes Ingram on the charge once more. Up the hill. Tries to make the move against Stephen Jelly. Gets the job done. And here comes Josh Cook up the inside. He goes through. He gains a place despite the weight. And there's drama in the background because that getting turned sideways was that Jelly. It was triple quick fit British touring car champion Ash Sutton. He's going to win the last round of the championship to add to the title. Ash Sutton crosses the line to win at Brands Hatch. Second, he's just going to be Dan Robottom ahead of Tom Ingram. The gap, a tenth of a second between them. Jake Hill is fourth. It's so after a really exciting weekend's racing there at Brands Hatch, Ash Sutton won the championship. It looked relatively easy from this side, but we could see from the emotion after the race two result, you what it really meant to you, really. Yeah, it was. Um, it, it was. It's one of those things. You can't sort of describe that feeling. Um, but I think ultimately it's just that pressure that gets taken off your shoulders. Coming coming down to the line, right end of race two, engineers straight on the radio going, you are the 2021 British Touring Cars champion. And suddenly all this weight is gone and you can just the, let the emotions flood out. And the initial emotions, I spent the whole wind lap pretty much crying and sobbing to myself. And it's quite embarrassing listening to the footage back. I'm not going to lie, but... Uh, yeah, it just shows how much you, you've been fighting for that and to finally go and achieve it and, and get it over the line. Well, I, I wouldn't worry about being embarrassed about it because as a, as, a, as a motor racing fan and British touring car fan, that's exactly what I want to see. I want to see the passion involved in it. But also that pressure, really, since round two back in whenever it was, was it May, something like that, you've been carrying maximum success ballast. So the pressure on you to perform has been immense. 
Yeah, go, obviously rolling into round or meeting two with the full weight in the car. And from that point onwards, every single meeting we've had full ballast just shows how much we've had to adapt to that situation. Um, but at the same time, how much pressure is involved with that? You're always crunching numbers, trying to work with it. But at the same time, still score them big points, big results. Well, that's I, and I, I would say, and I think a lot of people in the paddock would agree, the Ash Sutton 2021 version of Ash Sutton is is even more dangerous because it seems like, you know, you've suddenly sort of gone onto this different plane than you were before. You've still got the racecraft, you've still got the speed, but you've also you've got that sort of inherent ability just to avoid any incidents that are going on around you. I mean, that, that those three races were a case in point. You were probably pretty trouble free. I think there was only a bit of contact from Tom Chilton in uh, in race two, was it? The start of race two. Um, but, you know, did that cause you any problems? Uh, yeah, I think obviously all year round we've just tried to keep our nose clean. Uh, I, I've been the one that's potentially sometimes throwing my, my own results away. So I've adapted to that this year and I feel like that's been the biggest key element to it. But yeah, obviously brands, brands itself, coming in with the buffer that we had in terms of points, allowed me to manage the races. Um, qualifying wise, we, we were ahead of all our rivals. So race one, I could sit pretty and, and just keep my nose clean. Um, didn't need to do anything too drastic to to score any points, just had to sort of shadow Colin, see what he was doing, um, which is what we pretty much done in race two. A little bit of contact from Tom behind. Wasn't anything malicious. It was just one of those right start of the race incidents. Um, slight, slightly bent the rear toe link and we were racing the whole race with sort of a, a left hand down on, on the steering. But yeah, that's why I let Colin go. It, was, it wasn't worth the battle or trying to keep him there because if it had any, any more contact, who knows, it could have let go. No, exactly. I mean, I think that's a, a, would a would a twenty eighteen or twenty nine eight nineteen Ash Sutton have, have let him go and made that decision? No, uh, probably not. <laughs> if we're being realistic with the situation, he probably would have tried fighting back. Yeah, no, exactly. So, Matt, what have you got any stats regarding Ash's fantastic championship year? Well, it's a bit of an interesting one, really, because I think if you were to look at the three championship titles Ash has won, you'd probably say this has been the most dominant one. Um, you know, he went into the finale with that big lead rather than trying to chase someone down. And he's been out front for the vast majority of the season. But if you look at the stats, he hasn't won more races this year than any before any season before. He hasn't scored more podiums. He hasn't got more poles, hasn't got more fastest laps, hasn't led more laps and hasn't scored more points. So I guess in a way it shows that you can't always trust statistics, but it also shows maybe the level of competition that Ash has been up against this season because there's been a lot more guys behind him taking points off each other over the course of the year, which has obviously helped him in keeping that lead that he's had since early in the season and carrying it right through to the end of the year. In terms of his weekend at Brands Hatch, he did it one landmark in the final race. Uh, that victory was his 50th podium in the British Touring Car Championship and that's quite an impressive thing to hit when you consider that he's only been racing in the series for six seasons. I mean, three championships in six seasons is particularly impressive as well. Um, it was his 24th win, so that moves him level with Fabrizio Giovanardi. And it means that he's now won just over 13% of his races in the championship. And when you consider that he's had a season in a Subaru that wasn't the car it was 12 months earlier and he had his debut season in an MG that was coming towards the end of its life, even though at the time it was still competitive. I think it just shows how quick that guy is. Yeah, no, and also uh, the youngest triple champion British touring cars has had? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at the uh, other guys on the grid with him at the moment, who have got three championships to their name. I think you've got some of those who hadn't even won the first one um, at the age Ash is now. So, yeah, he's, he's the youngest one to have reached that landmark. So that's a bit scary for the rest of the field, Ash. So, I mean, you know, presuming that you're going to stay on the British touring car grid next year and onwards. I mean, I keep hearing rumours left, right and centre of where you're going to, whether you're going to Aussie V8s or world touring cars or things like that. It, what do you reckon? I mean, where, where do you think Ash Sutton's going to end up in 2022? Uh, I would like to stay put. I, I want, like I keep pointing out, I'd like to become a legend of, of the sport and, and and put my my name on the plaque and go, right, boys, that's what we need to aim for. Um, I'd like kids and, and young drivers who are coming up the ranks to sort of aim for what I've achieved. Obviously, I, I'm, I'm not that person to aim for at the minute, so we've still got some some time here to to get to that. Yeah, well, I, I, to, to be honest with you, I've done quite a lot of interviewing around the paddock and amongst the fans this year, and I would say you've probably got about 
80% of the fans there, uh, when I say, who's your favourite driver? And they say, Ash Sutton. And they're, they're kids, the dads, mums, whoever. So you're definitely a fan's favourite. Yeah, I think, the, obviously, the younger generation, you'll have the, some guys that are sort of still, yeah, Jason Plate, your Matt Mills. But then that younger generation is coming through now with myself, Tom Ingram, Jake Hill. So we're going to start seeing that swing in, in terms of fan base and sort of new rivalries that are, that are forming. Um, and it's, it's got some bright future ahead of it. Well, it's definitely a, a big soap opera event. Well, we're going to have a little chat after the break with Ash and also with Matt. Find out potentially what he's doing in 2022. I've asked him a little bit and he sort of veered away from that conversation and, and question. But let's see if he gives us an answer when you come back. Mm. Welcome back to the Pitch BTCC show. I'm joined by 2021 British Touring Car Champion Ash Sutton. Also, Matt Salisbury from Inside BTCC. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Not bad. Yeah. You? Good, good. Thanks for coming back with us again. So, very quickly... A very exciting British touring car season for you, Ash. You were brilliant. It looked pretty easy from where we were sitting. But I'm going to ask Matt Salisbury. He's going to give us a few facts and figures which tell us how difficult it was for you to be up the front of that championship. Well, I already said that Ash took his 50th podium in the championship at Brands Hatch. That podium was, of course, a race win. And that gave him five wins this season. That was the joint most of anyone over the course of the year. And he was level with Josh Cook, his good friend, who, of course, took two wins at Brands Hatch on finals day. Good for Josh, because it also meant he passed 300 points in the championship for the first time. And that was the most wins he's got in a season. So interestingly there, I mean, you and Josh, you were teammates together when you were back in MG a few years ago, but you've been really good mates. I mean, it, uh, how difficult is that to sort of really go wheel to wheel with somebody, but actually you're, you're good friends off the track? Yeah, it's been fantastic, I think. I've, uh, I even got a nice text from Josh saying, it's great to see how I've grown within the championship, how I've adapted this year. Um, he, he actually said he's really proud. So it, it's nice to have a friend like that away from the track, but... We can go door to door, and you just know you're always going to get left that that car with. But my God, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task taking Josh on. No, exactly. I mean, and he had a fantastic weekend and got himself up to third place, sort of getting ahead of you know two, getting ahead of Tom Ingram, getting ahead of Jake Hill, so got himself third on there, which I think is a, is a fair result for him because he has been you know really really quick at times this year. Yeah, I, I was gunning for him to be fair. I wanted him to to get second in the championship. I think. He put an absolutely mega weekend in to win race two, full ballast, with all of us behind him. You can't go wrong with that. He, he has really stepped, to, stepped up again. No, brilliant. So what else have you got for us, Matt? Well, there's an interesting little thing on Josh there, because you said how quick he's been all season. I mean, Josh got more faster slaps than anyone else this year. And the bonus points that you get for scoring faster slap and for leading a lap were actually key for Josh, because he scored more bonus points across the season than anyone else. If we didn't have those bonus points, he wouldn't have got third in the championship. So that was actually something really important, that pace that he had in that Honda throughout the course of the season. Um, going back to um, Ashy's podiums and wins, as well as sharing the, the record for most victories, he shares the record for most podiums this year. Got nine, which isn't a personal best for him, but he actually shared that with three other drivers, Tom Ingram and Jake Hill, both of whom were title contenders, and Gordon Shedden. So it just shows to have, you know, that many drivers scoring that many podiums. It shows how competitive it was at the sharp end of the grid in 2021. Oh, no, I totally agree. I mean, again, we all read social media to a certain extent. And you either have somebody who thinks, yeah, Shelton's brilliant. Or say, that's unfair, that infinity. How can he do this, that and the other? But the stats... Don't lie, really. The, the fact of the matter is it's really competitive, you know, and, and it could have really been any one of five or six of you who ended up with that championship if you were halfway through the season, let's say. But, I mean, you know, to talk us through that. I mean, do you reckon that – did you have any doubt doubt that you were going to win the championship? Uh, there, there was a point in the middle of the year where, obviously, Tom was absolutely dialed in with, with the high and high. Drake settled in with the Ford and Josh was pulling in some mega performance with, with the Honda. Obviously, we, we always know Colin's going to be there or thereabouts in the BM. Um, so you, you kind of, when there's that many of you, you're kind of trying to spread your, your load and try to work out roughly where, where you need to look. And that kind of fizzled out a little bit more for me when, when we started to fizzle to get, to get that bigger gap. 
Um, first, that 16 point gap from, from part two at Fruxton. Um, and then obviously that 30 point gap we, we ended up with at the end, it, it allowed me to just manage the sort of second and third a bit more rather than, than all of them. Well, talking about Thruxton, when we've been there, we've, we've been there twice a season for the first time in ages for the, for the last two seasons. But historically, rear wheel drives haven't been great round there. But actually, it's, that seems to have evened out a little bit now. What, what are your thoughts? Is there any reason for that? Uh, yeah, I think, obviously, we, we've managed to get, since they've re, done the retarmacking, I think it's just thrown a big curveball in, in terms of uh, the pace of cars there. I think front wheel drive cars now can last a little bit longer in terms of their, their race pace. But it's allowed us to get a bit closer in terms of that um, ultimate lap time, especially out the back of the circuit, when it's a, it can be a bit lively. Yeah, no, well, that's right. It's, it's quite a handful. But again, again as, we, as we've seen plenty of times, you don't mind a car moving around underneath you. So that's that's probably works in your favour. Anything else for us, Matt? A um, couple of other things. Um, looking at which drivers completed the most laps over the course of the season, this year we had 544 racing laps in the championship. Two drivers fell one lap short of doing 100%. They were Tom Ingram and Jason Plato. They were the two drivers who also didn't log a retirement all season, so they made it to the finish of every race. In terms of places gained for a lot of the season, it was Gordon Shedden who had uh, made up the most ground, primarily going back to Snetterton early on where he got disqualified from the uh, from the results of qualifying and Thruxton at the first round where he had an accident and had to come back through the field. But towards the end, Gordon was qualifying, you know, further up the order, wasn't making up as many places in the races. So he actually dropped back a bit and it was Ollie Jackson who ended up making up the most places over the year. The only driver to have gained over 100 spots. Uh, Aaron Taylor Smith was close behind in second and Tom Oliphant in third. Tom a driver who had to make up ground a bit towards the end of the season when things kind of tailed off for him uh, a little bit. And we've mentioned podiums and wins. In the Jack Sears Trophy, it was a, a dominant success this year for Dan Rowbottom. And a strong end to the season of him at Brands Hatch meant he was the leading Jack Sears Trophy runner in 23 of the races this season. And that's a new record. That's one more than Josh Cook managed in the season when he won the title. Well, that's right. Dan's had a great year. He's been on the show earlier in the year. But there's so many names there, Ash, that it looks like they, that, you know, with Gordon coming back to the series, sort of finding his feet towards the end of the year, which he had a, a bit of bad luck as well earlier on in the season. But then with Tom getting the hang of that Hyundai, you know, uh, Jake Hill sort of, again, getting hit the hold of the Ford and, and making making it get up the front of the field. But what that points to is a really competitive 2022 season. Um, you know, and, and so, I mean, the, the big question is, what are you going to be doing in 2022? <laughs> well, I'd like, if I knew that myself, I'd let you know. But um, yeah, look, there's, there's talks going on. Um, we're just trying to find out what, what options are available. Um, nothing's buttoned down yet, so... We'll wait and see. But in the meantime, I think I'm going to be sat on that sim right behind me and uh, getting some winter testing in. Well, that's that's the interesting thing, because you're away from the, the, the race circuit, your business, which is pure sims, builds simulators to, to help people have fun and get involved with racing, but also to train drivers as well. And I know having spoken to Aidan at the weekend, you know, who's obviously your teammate of the Laser Tools team, it's, it, he's really used the sim this year and he hasn't been a big fan of sims before that, but he's really started using it this year. Yeah, like I've seen Aiden try and turn a laptop on, so that, that says it all. But um, like he's uh, he well, there's Senna Proctor, him, myself, Dan Rowbottom, they've all got a sim by myself. Um, Adam Morgan's brought a few components, so there's drivers on the grid that have all been using these sims away from the track to develop their, their skills. And I've done a hell of a lot with Aiden with our engineers on the sim prior to every every meeting, and I think that has been a big switch for him. He's made it's made him. Sort of turn up a bit more prepared. His uh, his A games there rather than spending FP one, FP two finding feet. We're there from the get go. So, what do you think? What's the big benefit of going on the sim? Obviously, there's track knowledge and getting in the. Is it the same as driving on the track? Uh, yeah. I, so, so for me, like, I wouldn't sit here and say we use them for learning tracks and stuff like that because most drivers can pick a track up in sort of five laps. But it's more muscle memory, techniques. So we focus a hell of a lot on our braking techniques. Um, throttle application and obviously then making a setup to the car 
and seeing how we need to adapt as drivers. So that's what we focused on this year. And I think that's been a key element to how we won the team championship. Oh, it's fantastic. That's good. So, Matt, what else do you think? 2022, what are your thoughts of, of what's going to happen next season? Well, I think as we look towards 2022, this is probably going to be one of the seasons where we've got the most unknowns. And that's not because we've got necessarily loads of new drivers or we've got loads of new cars. It's because we've got a regulation change and we've got the move to the hybrid technology for the first time. And why that's going to be important is because the hybrid technology is replacing success ballast. Now, everyone can see this season that part of Ash's success has been because of how well that Infinity has been engineered to run with maximum weight. Because for a driver to lead the championship for as long as Ash has done and to pull results out of the bag with maximum ballast all season shows that they've got that car dialed in. How easy is it going to be to dial a car in next year when it's all down to power and how much hybrid you get. All the teams that have worked really hard to engineer cars to run a maximum ballast, that's all going to count for nothing next season. So how teams approach that, how drivers approach that is going to be really interesting. And I, and I think it's going to put the cat amongst the pigeons a bit more. Um, it's going to take time for drivers to get used to how they use it. It's going to take time for teams to get used to how they use it. That's why we're starting the season a little bit later to get some testing underway. So Whilst I'd probably expect to see the same names up towards the front, we might see them jumbled up a bit more. And after a season where they've been jumbled quite a lot already, I think that means that they're quite interesting. So looking at next year, Ash, and I know you can't tell us what you're doing or, or, or who you're doing it with next year or, or on the grid of wherever you happen to end up. But as the team started working on any of that for next year and looking at what the hybrid means and how you're going to have to engineer the car maybe differently next year? Yeah, so I think as Matt touched on, there's a, a big element there where we lose this success by lesson. That has been a big part to how we've achieved the, cha the championship, championship this year. Um, and because we've engineered the car very, very well to carry it away. So as soon as these regulations come out and we found out that that's not going to be a part of or a factor of, of 2022 and that it's going to be controlled by the, the amount of hybrid we have, we suddenly have both sat there and we've had many, many discussions that started very early on in, in the phase of, how do we get the car to work? What's the hybrid going to do? And I've been working already with, with my engineer for 2022. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it will be a big, big reset. I think it's fantastic for the championship. The, the whole championship is going to be greener, especially with the fuel and things like that. Um, I, I do think it's going to be a, a massive step forward in terms of the performance of drivers as well. Um, we've got to step our game up. We've got to learn a new graft here. So... I'm, I'm buzzing for it. I, I don't mind a new challenge. Well, I think all that experience that you've got on the sim that's sitting behind you is going to be a big helping hand, pressing all different knobs and buttons here, there and everywhere when you're, when you're driving around. So thanks for that. But thanks very much for joining us, Ash. Brilliant season for you. And thanks for joining us, Matt Salisbury from Inside BTCC as well. Thanks very much for you, the viewers, for joining us on this Pitch BTCC show journey. It's been great year. Great to have all your feedback. Look forward to seeing you again in 2022. Thank you.